Great. Thank you all for coming to the Offshore Renewable Energy Series 2021 edition, Learning As We Go. My name is Marianne Hawkins. I am a student at URI studying environmental and natural resource economics. And I'm also working at the Coastal Resources Center in Rhode Island Sea Grant. And I'm so happy to be a part of moderating this awesome discussion on workforce development for offshore wind. So thank you to our sponsors, Rhode Island Sea Grant, Coastal Resources Center, and District Halls, Providence, activated by Innovation Studio. Thank you so much for joining everybody. We are so excited to have a really um, informative and sort of informal roundtable style um, discussion today. So just a little background about why we're here today. So offshore wind is a actually 30 year old industry, even though it's quite new in the United States, it's been um, evolving in Europe for the past couple of decades. And as you can see in this map here, um, there is a lot of potential for great harnessing of wind energy off of our coasts. So now the US is working on joining the game that Europe has been um, doing for the past couple of decades and trying to catch up. So we having our first um, wind turbines off the coast of Rhode Island are really interested in this topic, especially workforce. So because the offshore wind um, energy and industry process is multi-phased, it really presents a unique opportunity to involve people of so many different disciplines. Um, as you can see, there's a planning and leasing process, um, a site, a site assessment process, as well as the construction and operations. And each turbine can have a life cycle of um, up to 30 years. So uh, with that being said, we have some expert panelists joining us today who we're so happy to have with us. And they will be um, representing different phases and different disciplines within this industry. And we also have some awesome student panelists here to ask some questions that we know everybody is dying to hear the answers to. So with that being said, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we will pass the um, spotlight around to our panelists to give a brief introduction of themselves. So if we can start off with Drew Carey, please. Um, sure, I'm Drew Carey. I'm the CEO of Inspire Environmental. We're based in Newport, Rhode Island. Um, and as you can see from the map behind me, uh, we uh, got involved in offshore wind with the very beginning of the Block Island Wind Farm, uh, working with Chris Olis, Olith, uh, and uh, we have actually been involved in all phases from the early planning stages through site assessment, uh, the COP, so-called COP, and on into construction and monitoring. We just finished uh, seven years of monitoring of this wind farm about to release the results of fisheries through both commercial trawl, lobster data. But our primary focus is assessing the seafloor itself. So you see a map behind me of you know, one level of what the seafloor looks like. We dive down, not, not personally, but, but use instrumentation to go down to the seafloor and measure the seafloor health before, during, and after uh, these projects are developed. Uh, and that provides a lot of information about how they're sited, where they're sited, uh, and what potential effects there are. Our firm has a variety of different scientists. So we have benthic ecologists, fishery scientists, uh, geologists, uh, statisticians. So we do rely heavily on uh, recruiting folks from universities, both engineering and scientific disciplines. Great, thank you for that awesome introduction, Drew. Um, next, we'll pass over to Chris Olith. Hello, thanks for having me. My name is Chris Olith, and I'm the executive director of this special initiative on offshore wind. We are an offshore wind strategy group that is uh, foundation funded and based at the University of Delaware. I myself am a URI graduate and feel wonderful ties to the state of Rhode Island, um, have a master's degree in marine affairs from URI, and uh, now am here in my home office in New Jersey. So, so great to see so many people interested in offshore wind and, and thanks to URI and others for hosting these, these great workshops. Um, see a lot of familiar faces, so, so thanks all for being here. Um, quickly, my background is primarily focused on working in the developer space. Until about three weeks ago, I was working with the offshore wind developer Orsted, 
And my focus has always really been in the stakeholder engagement, community engagement, and uh, communications piece. So I'll be interested to talk today a little bit about some of the softer side, the humanities, the liberal arts degrees, and other skill sets that apply in the offshore wind world. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, okay, we will jump over to Jeff Tingley, please. Oh, hi, hey, Marion. Thanks so much for having me. This is one of really the high points. It's really talked about offshore wind and how people can get in the industry. I work for a firm called the Exodus Group, which is a global consulting firm uh, based in Aberdeen, Scotland, with about 400 consultants world, world, worldwide. Uh, the mission of the company is really very simply put, it's to deliver a responsible energy future. So we're very involved in, in renewables. We're very involved in energy transition from oil and gas into renewables and some of the other um, higher carbon energy sources. Um, our consultants are involved in all phases of a project from how the lease areas are determined, what is the capacity of a lease area, right through the decommissioning of wind farms. We've been in business for about 20 years so we've worked at a lot of the wind farms in Europe um, and are opened an office in the US about nine months ago. Um, my particular uh, expertise is in supply chain development and market entry. Now, what's really interesting about the offshore wind industry, and I think why it's so exciting, is that it's so complex and so large, there's not one single discipline that the industry doesn't need right now at some point. And so it's an industry that is looking for talent. Uh, it's very new in the US, as Mary Ellen said, to start out. And as a result, we're really starting from ground zero, but it's a really transitional, um, you know, a very, very transitional industry and an industry that's forming as we speak. So I think for anyone that wants a long-term career in something that changes all the time, that has incredible social and geo political impacts, you couldn't want to be in a better spot. Um, I got interested because I was, I was with the Rhode Island Commerce Corporation as a vice president of business development and worked in attracting wind companies into Rhode Island and began to sort of just see the complexities and see the opportunities. So it really kind of took over my brain and I'd be glad to answer any questions anyone has and hopefully get a bunch of you to come and join us, join the industry. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. Okay, and next we will jump over to our student panelists. So Jess, if you wanna start off. Yeah, sure. Hi, my name is Jess Hiltz. I'm a first year master's student here at the University of Rhode Island studying marine affairs. Um, I graduated this past spring from URI with degrees in marine biology and marine affairs. And my research interests in terms of offshore wind have to do with how offshore wind installation affects marine mammals, as well as how policy can help play a role in mitigating these effects. Thank you so much. And last but certainly not least, we have Maeve. Hi everyone, my name is Maeve Story. Uh, I am a first year master's student at the University of Rhode Island in ocean engineering. Um, I got involved with offshore wind actually my uh, fourth year in my undergrad when I had the opportunity to work on a offshore wind turbine installation study in Germany during my year abroad. Um, so that was my introduction to offshore wind. And then for my master's degree, I've been afforded the opportunity to work on the Block Island Structural Health Monitoring Study here in Rhode Island. So I'm, I'm working on structural and geotechnical analyses uh, to that end. So I'm, I'm really happy to be here and be a part of this conversation. Thank you so much. So as you can see, we have a panel full of experts in many different disciplines within this great industry. So um, just before we jump into the questions, I wanted to say it would be awesome to hear where everybody is tuning in from if you wanna put that over in the chat. Also, we really want to hear from 
you folks, particularly students, we want to know what questions you have so we can take advantage of this time with this great panel to ask them the questions that you have. So if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat throughout the, uh, the webinar and we will, um, we will vocalize them to the panelists as well. Um, okay, so to get started, let's, let's do a softball question. Um, I would love to hear about some of our expert panelists' paths to where they are now. Um, Chris, if you could start us off, I would love to hear about your path to where you are now. Certainly, yeah. And uh, as Drew mentioned, um, he and I have been kind of working in the industry together. Uh, this will be my 15th year. Um, my mother still says, so are you guys ever really going to build like a real wind farm or what's going on 15 years, you know? Um, so we are a little far behind, uh, you know, love the Block Island wind farm, but the U.S. really needs utility scale projects. Um, and so my path started really at the University of Rhode Island, uh, where so many things, so many great things in the world start at URI. I was uh, entering my master's program there and had spent a year abroad in Germany and lived in Bremerhaven, which is actually one of the ports for foundation manufacturing for offshore wind in the North Sea. And so spent a year working there preparing for my marine affairs master's degree and had no idea what I wanted to do my thesis on. Um, but then I started observing in Europe the real diversity in energy supply that was offered versus what I saw back home in the United States, especially in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic. I wasn't seeing wind farms, I wasn't seeing solar at scale, but I was seeing it in Germany and I was seeing it in, in all over the EU. And so I started asking questions about why that's not happening. And there was a, an ill-fated project proposed in the US right around that same time, it was called Cape Wind which is a project, an offshore wind project proposed off the coast of Cape Cod that never did come to fruition. And so that project was very controversial. Um, and you know, my background is in stakeholders. And so that was a very you know, volatile stakeholder driven project about 15 years ago. And so that was you know, really churning up and I was seeing the work in Europe. And when I came back for my, to do my master's thesis, I said, you know, I really wanna, explore why not offshore wind for Rhode Island. And so I had the opportunity to do uh, use a, a GIS based thesis program um, where essentially did some preliminary potential mapping off the coast of Rhode Island for ideal spots for offshore wind. Turns out federal regulators, you know, did that later for, you know, for more definitive answers, but it was a really great entree into thinking about the different dynamics that go into a wind farm, including uh, you know, deconflicted areas because of the many users who are using the ocean space, the, uh, you know, the seafloor structure, what the, uh, what the, what the environment looks like there. So where the organisms are, where's the density of uh, sensitive environments. So, you know, really a lot went into that GIS, um, you know, programming and, and learned a lot from that. And I was fortunate, which something that I would call out to students now to think about if there are students out there is uh, to find yourself an industry advisor. I had a co-advising team as part of my thesis. I had a, uh, an industry or technical advisor as well as my advisor at URI. And turns out working with that industry or technical advisor was one of the best decisions I ever made. And when I graduated the next Monday, I started my job at Blue Water Wind, which is one of the first, essentially the first offshore wind developer in the United States secured our first long-term power purchase agreement in Delaware, ironically off the coast of Delaware for a wind farm 13 years ago. And that also through a long circuitous route never really came to fruition, obviously. So started my developer journey there, had a chance to work with Sandra Whitehouse, which was a real dream come true at Ocean Conservancy, had some time in, in the NGO world and ended up back working in this development space. So, uh, you know, it, there really is all opportunities for social science, uh, you know, engineering, math, the more STEM paths to get to offshore wind, uh, really any anything um, that the industry needs at all, as Jeff said. So that's more or less uh, the route that took me to where I am today. Thank you so much for sharing. What a great journey. Um, I would love to hear Drew's journey to um, his current place now. <laughs> it's a pretty long one. Uh, I won't go through all the details. Um, I think I'll kind of highlight uh, the shift from sort of basic, more academic research to 
applied work, because I think that's, you know, from a scientific point of view, that's really crucial for uh, how you and eventually need to work in this industry. So my own path, I went to um, an extremely interdisciplinary uh, state college in Washington State, uh, where inherently everything was interdisciplinary. And I got restless and I moved to Scotland and I finished my degree there where interdisciplinary was uh, a multi-syllabic word that nobody had really ever heard of. And uh, I got very excited by the combination of marine ecology and geology. This sort of meant, meant sense to me, the two things felt linked. And off I went really pursuing uh, very much basic research. By basic research, I mean, just follow an interesting problem of some kind, not really worrying about what it may or may not be applied to. But I always had in the back of my mind, you know, what might, uh, what might the reasonable use of this be, in part from that early background with um, the interdisciplinary stuff. I landed at Wesleyan University in Connecticut as a professor and uh, sort of developed a bunch of interdisciplinary stuff there. And oddly enough, it was at the time when the uh, UN Conference on the Law of the Sea was in New York. And uh, so I began teaching a lot of courses on ocean resources, um, uh, how law applied to resources in the ocean and the interplay between science and, and society. And that really triggered a lot more interest in how ocean science could be applied uh, to a lot of human problems. I then uh, ended up in a consulting firm and that you know, just immersed me immediately into applied science. And two things really jumped out at me. One is that in the applied work, it's inherent that you work as a team. So I found that that was a real strength of mine was to gather a team, work together as a team and, and solve problems. And, and it worked out very well for me. As it happened, the background that I had was a perfect fit for the kind of application that we needed to do. Um, I was hired by my current business partner and we worked together for 30 years applying this technique to ocean floor mapping and assessment of marine health. So getting an offshore wind was honestly uh, serendipity. As Chris will attest, there was a procurement from the state of Rhode Island. I was on a team, we lost. Uh, the winning team was looking for Rhode Island content and our company was in Rhode Island. And as a result, um, we had an opportunity to get into the industry, but we had to prove ourselves. If we hadn't been very good, I, we wouldn't have last very long. So, you know, part of what Jeff was talking about, part of what is going on in the industry is leveraging state involvement in projects, PPAs, and in exchange, looking for work. In other words, jobs. Uh, the states are willing to get engaged because they're hoping it develops a workforce. Rhode Island is no different. Um, I think because of that early beginning, both my company, but also the informal network of groups here in Rhode Island has really pioneered a core element of support of offshore wind. You know, Chris can attest to what's happening in New York, New Jersey, and Massachusetts, and a lot of other places. And so these core groups are going to spin up and get going. Rhode Island happens to have a little bit of an advantage, a little bit of a lead. Uh, proximity to a lot of the sites definitely helps. And uh, so, you know, that offshore wind is only one of about five things that we do. But uh, in this case, if we'd been based in, I don't know, South Carolina, I, I think we'd be catching up at this point. Awesome insight. Thank you so much. And lastly, I'll bounce that question over to Jeff. And after that, we'll have um, our student panelists start asking some questions. Well, it's interesting. I'm probably one of the um, people on this panel that has the most miles on him. And, you know, it's interesting. I started out before I, before I got involved in offshore wind, I spent 30 years in the technology business. And I got involved in it in its very, very early stages when personal computers were really not even out yet. So it was this, this sort of world-changing industry. 
And I found that to be absolutely fascinating because A, the work was very fast paced and very varied, but also it had great sort of implications socially and economically and all other kinds of things that I find sort of interesting. And I don't forget there was a story, and I don't know whether it's true, but it's great folklore. When when Steve Jobs was at Apple, and Apple was sort of in a very bad spot, and the investor said, you've got to go find a CEO. So he was out interviewing CEOs, and he talked to a guy named John Scully. And John Scully was the person he was going to pick. And Mr. Scully said to Steve Jobs, why should I join Apple? And John Scully was current, was then at Pepsi. And Steve Jobs sort of stopped and looked at him and said, do you want to consider do you want to continue to sell sugared water or do you want to change the world? And so we have an opportunity right here in offshore wind to really tackle a piece of a very large global problem. And so as I started to work at it at the Rhode Island Commerce Corporation, I saw the implications of it sort of worldwide and nationwide. I mean, I mean it can grow a big workforce, so it can retrain a lot of people. It can <clears throat> replace high carbon energy with low carbon energy. These are construction projects. These are science projects. These are ocean oceaneering projects. And so the number of industries that come together to successfully build a turbine are just really sort of mind boggling. And I just found that you can do something that has that needs people from all different backgrounds of experience, needs new people to come into it at a rapid rate, and has a very large social um, benefit behind it. That's kind of a really great combination. And so what got me into it was the fact that it it's an industry that touches so many things that frankly are important to me personally. So that's how I that's how I got into it. And then, you know, and then at Exodus being with a firm that sort of has this expertise in all different parts of wind farm, you know, development and permitting and environmental and construction and supply chain development sort of allows me to sort of touch all parts of it and mostly learn about all parts of it. So that's what, so that's how I got into it. And that's, why I'm here to stay. That's awesome. I love that anecdote there. All right, let's bounce over to our student panelists to ask some questions to our experts now. Okay, so I'll take the, I'll give the first question, I guess. Um, I think the thing that first comes to mind is, you know, what skills are going to be needed by those hoping to enter the workforce and you know, maybe what steps they need to take um, to be prepared. And is there, um, is there a lack of specific skill sets that the industry really needs going forward from here? Well, there's certainly a lot to unpack there, but I can um, maybe start Mary Ellen, if that's okay. Um, it's interesting that this industry is so new, even though some of us have been in it, you know, for some time, more or less, by and large, it's a new industry in the US. And so there aren't many people who have experience working in offshore wind. And so one thing I want to make sure I think we communicate today is that just because you don't have experience in offshore wind yet, don't let that stop you from trying to break into this industry. Right now, it's still relatively small when you look across the, you know, amount of developers there, are, you know, half a dozen or so really active, um, you know, companies who are building and, and developing these projects. And we should talk a little bit about what offshore wind developers do specifically. But, you know, there, there's a small handful of those companies doing that. And there are only a few hundred people in each one. So there's still a relatively small pool, like, let's say, if you were going to like a large engineering or construction company. Um, 
the skills really run across the board. I think some of the most important ones are, you know, your desire and your ability to, to have good communication with, uh, you know, whether it's written or oral communication with potential employers and the opportunity to get out there and network yourself because, you know, a piece of paper with a degree listed on it can go so far. Uh, but I think, you know, being able to impress upon a potential employer you know, your desire and, and your passion for something, as, as Jeff said, that is really changing the world um, is really exciting. Uh, it, it can be really hard to break in because of the lack of, you know, the, the size of the industry, I guess I'll say at this point, but I wouldn't let that deter you because uh, getting in now is a super exciting time to be in from early days. I mean, I can say from from a consulting perspective, we look for critical thinking. Um, so, and you know, a critical thinking is what we try to sell our clients as we help them, as we help guide them through this process. And so, we have, for example, at Access mentoring programs. So, we hire a lot of people right out of school uh, that have various degrees, some technical, some non-technical, and put them within teams where they work with more experienced individuals. And from that process, find out where their interests lie and where their talents lie, and then bring them, bring them along into different pieces of our business. So just like building wind farms, there's not a wind farm industry here. There are abutting industries that can pivot or change to, in order to support wind farm, we see people sort of the same way. Someone has the critical thinking skills, someone has the, um, the technical educational background that can become a base and then get them involved in, and show them the different parts of the industries that, for example, Exodus works in and which one of those interests them. So we really like to hire people that want to learn and are open to a path that they may not know of yet, but will become clear as they begin working in it. That's sort of an exciting discovery process for everyone. And I see that in the chat, we had a question from Cal Brown that sort of referenced the same question that we just answered. Um, and he, he referenced um, in Boston, Mass, there's been a lot of studies um, suggesting that there'll be a job creation market from offshore wind but he did acknowledge that, you know, usually there's there's background experience required. So Cal, I hope that answered your question. But if you have a follow-up question, feel free to put that in the chat as well. And we can we can ask that as well. So I think I would just add to uh, what Chris and Jeff said that um, be prepared for a pace. Uh, this emerging industry is very fast paced. Mm -hmm. um, you need to be incredibly flexible uh, as you get into it. As much of a fan as I am of interdisciplinary learning, interdisciplinary work, multidisciplinary, the variety of ways we talk about it, I also think it's really important during your education to get grounding in a discipline um, because if you are only skating across the surface of a lot of different topics, um, it's going to be a little more difficult to understand how to how to really sort of dig into one of those. Now, it's very likely, whatever that discipline is that you happen to choose, you may not be applying that specific discipline in a position. And that, that doesn't really concern me. It's demonstrating the ability to actually dive a little deeper, dig down into a content, and be able to prepare and represent that in whatever context you're working. So this goes across the board, social science, liberal arts, uh, science, engineering, whatever it might be. So as a guide, you know, what you are particularly interested in, take it as far as you can. I often say as well that when it comes to mathematics, take as much as you can stand and then take a little bit more because there's always opportunity, uh, the, the de development of a lot of these concepts do end up relying heavily on quantitative skills. And so your ability to manipulate quantitative information can be a discriminator, can 
uh, pull you out of a crowd. Um, and so the flexibility comes from recognizing that your carefully honed resume and the things that you really care about may just be getting you in the door and you may end up going in a very, very different direction and it may happen a lot faster than you think. And just to add on to that and to highlight something that Sandra put in the uh, in the chat box in case folks are, didn't see it, uh, you know, they're really, and I, URI has such a strong uh, marine policy, ocean policy, marine affairs program. So I'm assuming that some folks out there are in that program and you, there are not a lot of programs even in the world that focus on these things. And so it's really cool to look at the offshore wind industry and see how many people came out of that policy program. There's a really strong need uh, to, especially at this nascent time of the industry or this transitional time in the industry, to make sure we're getting the policy right and understanding where we've come from and where we're going uh, in the policy world is really exciting. And so if you're out there thinking, oh, you know, I'm, I'm not an engineer, I don't, you know, I'm not using that side of my brain, the policy world is something that's very exciting and, um, and, and really has a lot of depth to it, as Drew was pointing to, really having, you can get really deep in that one issue. Well, let me jump on that one for just a second, because I just saw uh, Sandra's uh, point there, which is, I think one of the most important things to understand is that virtually every developer of offshore wind in the United States is a European firm. And they're forming joint ventures, they're forming complex, uh, different kinds of companies. And the translation of the European learning and perspective into a US policy framework, a US science framework, a US engineering supply chain is a major challenge. And so your own grounded experience here actually has some value. So that, that I think is something to be very mindful of. There was a question here from Lance about finance, um, being a finance major. And, you know, that's one of the complexities of wind farms. They are really expensive projects. And Chris probably knows this better than any of us on this panel. But, you know, one thing that we look at or that the industry looks at is, you know, what is the potential capacity of a lease area? So as people put bids into leases, they need really deep financial analysis as to what is the potential. When states get bids from developers, there's, is it really, do the numbers make sense? Can they actually, for the money that they're gonna spend, deliver the rate payer costs that they say they're going to do? Um, it, these are very heavily upfront financed, obviously. So the financial models are different. So how is it bankable or financeable? So that is something, that is an area that really does um, require expertise within the industry. And there was another one about um, off takers and transmission owners. I mean, it's interesting. You look at something like Dominion Energy in Virginia is both a developer and an off taker. So there are, there are different models evolving where how the utilities are involved in these projects. And that's something that's once again, as both Drew and Chris said, it's an industry that changes very, very quickly and very dr dramatically. And it changes at all phases from the financing to the building, to the ownership, et cetera. I think the key thing to remember in all of in all of offshore, when at the end of the day, it's all about the rate payer. So, and so the rate payer is what um, all projects look towards. Great, thank you. Okay, let's, um, let's have Jess up next. Sure, so this is something that we've already touched on a little bit, but um, earlier in our conversation today, Chris, you mentioned soft skills. And I'm curious, beyond academic and technical skills, which soft skills do you value most during the hiring process and beyond? Well, for me, it's the communication skills. I have um, my undergraduate is in journalism and communication. And frankly, if you're in the offshore wind world or any other, uh, any other sector and any other business type, whether it's NGO, uh, you know, you're working at a university, whatever it is, it will be important to be able to communicate with 
your internal and external stakeholders. Um, and I think when you can demonstrate that in an interview process, whether that's a strong cover letter, whether that's not showing up 45 minutes early for an interview and sitting in the lobby, which has happened to me, so never do that. Um, you know, be there early, but don't ring the bell that early, you know? Anyway, you know, just really having those communication skills, being able to read the body language, those skills can, can be challenging and ones that are hard to develop, especially now that so many of us are working in this virtual world. And so I just want to highlight it. I don't really necessarily have any silver bullets to how best you learn it, but I think it's the relationship building and the communication skills that for me always drive it home. When someone looks me in the eye when they're talking, when they really have a thoughtful cover letter with their resume, that's not just boilerplate, that's passionate and engaging. I would say that working in the offshore wind industry, Chris is absolutely right. Communications are a critical, critical skill because of the various stakeholders that are involved. And depending on what you do, you'll deal with the fisheries, you'll deal with the government in Washington, you'll deal with permitting, you'll deal with you know, uh, coastal resources management. There is so much communication that has to take place no matter sort of what part of the business you're in, that becomes a really critical skill. And in my opinion, that's what people will be looking for, backed up by what your, um, backed up by what your sort of, as you said, Jess, your hard skills, but the ability to communicate across a wide stakeholder audience, I think is really important, both internally within your company and externally to those affected by the project. I have a question. Um, I used to work for the Marine Fishery Service, and we had this relationship with NOAA down at the Bay Campus. And what I found was, you know, the sh they had the shark studies, they had the codfish uh, uh, studies. And um, I think what I found out through my later career is that not only is community education needed, but it's an essential part of the green process, wind farms and tidal farms and electricity. And uh, it's all about customer service. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. So when I go down to the beach and I see, you know, in the, in the, you know, remember when the uh, uh, small she small clams uh, waded up on shore, and that was a pollution problem. Now, my ex-wife worked for DEM. I mean, worked for uh, yeah DEM, and then she went on to the DOT. She knew where all the oil leaks were. And uh, because she had been so well versed in water resources. So I've come to realize that it's not the people who are smart that you hire, but it's the ones that are persevering through the fight, exiting not, dealing with life, purchasing items that would allow for, you know, like the solar panels that are being given out uh, by the state. Brian, we're going to take we're going to take one of the questions from the comments. So if you want to continue uh, to put your question in the comment, that would be great. All right. The chat box. Thank you. Um, so, Fred, we saw Fred Matera's question um, talking about um, commercial fishing and building up um, this industry and potentially leaving up commercial fishing. So, Fred, do you actually want to clarify your question? Um, you can unmute. Well, as Brian was alluding to, you know, when he goes down to the beach or when he goes anywhere, well, if you go down to Point Judith or you go down to any coastal communities, you know, we have uh, tourism, we have people in the Ocean State here, Rhode Island, that love to go down and buy fish, uh, lobsters, crab, fin fish, you name it. Um, all I'm hearing here is how do we get more people into the offshore wind to, at the detriment of the commercial fishing industry? The only person here that I found that um, we've had a working relationship with 
uh, as far as the science of the ecosystem and management and how do we coexist together is Drew. Uh, Drew has worked with us through Deep Water and through Orsted in projects and uh, um, he's been uh, influential and helpful. So uh, communication is important and I agree. Listening, listening. You know, I listen to Chris and I don't hear an awful lot about listening to stakeholders and trying to appease stakeholders and deal with stakeholders and recognize that we need good science. You know, uh, Jeff Tingley comes from Aberdeen. Aberdeen, I've been there since the 80s. And it's, it's an oil and gas, you know, mega uh, city. And that's what they deal with. And that's what it's all about. And all of their people that they hire are from the academia and technical side. And I'm sorry, but I think so far what I've seen is all the European based other than some of the science here. So please just open your eyes and be receptive to what is happening to stakeholders. And a lot of those primary stakeholders are us, commercial fishermen that are now being displaced and told, oh, we'll have a place for you oh, we'll work with you and we'll coexist together. And this is more of what University of Rhode Island has continued to do. We keep bringing this part of it for workforce development, but we really, workforce development is to maintain what we already have out there as a workforce. And I just keep feeling like it's, it's starting to get lopsided. And so I just, I want to express my concerns as a commercial fisherman and representing, you know, hundreds and hundreds of commercial fishermen up and down the coast. And that we need to be able to preserve that. You know, we're harvesters. Um, we draw energy out of that ocean in healthy uh, protein, you know, to feed people. And so don't, don't lose that, you know, don't lose that perspective. If you're gonna communicate, you gotta listen as well. So please listen to this industry do the right things. We, uh, human nature is, we'll build it and we'll deal with the consequences later. It's what you're doing in the UK. You're dealing with the consequences later that are screwing up and, and, and having problems. You see what's happening now in Texas. You see what's happening in Germany. Germany's had to go out to get energy because of a cold freeze. So just, I'm not saying just that's, that is the, I, the, the problem overall, but I just ask you to reflect and you know be open-minded, that's all. So Fred, this is kind of like a word to the wise of um, people entering the offshore wind industry. That, that's what you're kind of saying? Yeah, yeah, just I mean, I mean, you ask some questions and I think what Maeve asked was a question was a very good question. You know, what are the skills? What are things? And that basically, because you have an audience here that are a lot of students, you know, they're going to school, they're learning things, they're understanding more in science, technology. Chris has been involved in it a long time. Jeff's been involved in it. Same, same with Drew. So you have excellent panel here, people. Um, and all I'm saying, I'm on the other side of it. I'm the guy that's the stakeholder. I'm the guy that you need to communicate with. And so I want you to be aware that there are two sides. Yes, if you want to get into that business, go for it. It's a lucrative business. They're taking more of our scientists away from our fisheries. They're taking some of the fishermen too, you know, uh, to act as liaisons. Yeah, uh, but can I say something still here? good. So um, I'm just going to say something here. So Fred, you bring up a good point. So there are, um, whether it be commercial fishermen or municipalities that um, also need um, uh, people to um, engage and to understand and, and to represent them in this um, as this development takes place. So what advice would you, aside from communications and, and, and which is excellent, what advice would you give to these young professionals as far as skills that they, should they, should they learn, take a fisheries management class? Should they, you know, what, what do you, what advice would you give to them? Well, open your mind and be receptive. You know, I, I continue to do presentations for 
classes at URI, I've been asked to do Williams College and others. And when I start to talk to them and introduce them to what happens to the fishermen and what is potential, what the potentials are and what are the pitfalls, um, they're alarmed because their professors haven't exposed them, them to any of this, not at all. It's all one-sided. It's all green. We have to go green. No matter what, it has to be that. And that's fine. I have kids and I have grandchildren and I want to reduce the carbon footprint, but I don't want to do it at the expense of another industry. I don't. And I don't want 100% uh, reliance on you know offshore wind or any renewable energy. I don't want 100%. It's not going to work. And you worry about the rate payers, the rate payers are going to get whatever. So I say, you know, open your mind, listen. Maybe there's two sides of this. Maybe we could use better representation to articulate and uh, justify our concerns as well, science wise. So if you're a marine biologist and you understand ecosystems and everything else, um, we could benefit from that as well. So there's two sides. So consider both. If you don't mind, Mary, let me jump in just a minute. Uh, uh, thanks, Fred. I think it's a really important perspective. And I think, you know, for all of us, the future is quite mixed. Um, as you well know, we hope and continue to work for both near-term collaboration. So the much of the science that's being done is, at least on the resources, is being done in collaboration with commercial fishermen. That's absolutely key. There's virtually no other way to do it. But the future is one where one hopes that the development of this industry can coexist with both commercial and recreational fishing. And that's not gonna be a straightforward path. I think there has to be a lot of issues addressed to do that. As far as people getting experience, um, I really think having some experience offshore uh, is extremely valuable. My son is a commercial fisherman. Um, he's been exposed at a very short time, you know, a year or two, but, you know, it has opened his mind. He's quite, you know, he spent a few years at college. College wasn't really for him, uh, but he's he's very interested in, in just working out of doors. Um, so whether he continues that or he moves into some other form, I think we're recognizing that the maritime industry and maritime trades writ large, including uh, fishermen, including technicians, including uh, support, is really the long-term uh, uh, footprint of this because you will be taking vessels out constantly. That'll have effects conflicting with, with fishing activities and those have to be worked out. So on all aspects of the marine trades, I see there being a really important series of developments, uh, technologies, people, experience. And so if you, as somebody interested in an offshore industry, aren't willing to go to sea, uh, you know, you need, to, you need to spend some time at least becoming aware of what the risks and uh, consequences are of trying to make a living at sea. It's not a trivial uh, thing to experience. Well said, Drew, thank you. I would like to add um, one thing, Fred, you have very good points. I was the acoustic engineer in the lead for the deep water wind project. And we worked with a squid fisherman boat and those people got our equipment in and out of the water better than anyone else could. So I think looking for local uh, you know, these types of people to, to support is, is, is key. Great. Can we move over? Um, I think Maeve had a question to ask. Well, actually, my question is more of a follow-up uh, for the discussion we've already been having. Um, I think Fred made a lot of really great points, and it kind of connects to something that someone else in the chat um, had posted a question about. So I'm going to read Monica's question, and then I'll pose, I'll pose my follow-up question. Uh, Monica's question was, with the offshore wind sector growing, do we see it becoming more of a privatized industry like the current fossil fuel industry, or do we envision it as more of a, quote, local power in which the residents would have control over the decisions related to the grid? 
And I think that's a really great question that relates into the, the conversation we're currently having. Um, I'd be curious to know what sort of best practices for involving the local community in the developing workforce would be. So we're, we're talking about having these conversations between different sectors of um, different marine industries in the area. And I think talking about, well, how do we involve the local community um, all the way around in, in decisions related to this would be a good topic. Can I, can I respond to Maeve's question? I think that's a very good question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I don't know if you've read lately the stalemate, uh, stymied position that Austed and the CRMC and the FAB have had in what we call a mitigation process for the South Fork. Um, first off, I am absolutely astounded that Cox's Ledge is uh, designated as an essential fish habitat for 37 species. And yet we're still gonna put 16 turbines on that site. So, and there will be tremendous displacement and loss of revenue. And a lot of that will be from the recreational fisheries. And unfortunately, recreational fisheries doesn't have a record of uh, landings and data and revenue, but we, they are so far apart that actually there has been really no negotiations. They just throw, you know, two cents on the table and we're still trying to get a dollar um, because we're concerned about what impact will they have on an essential fish habitat and what economic impact will they have. So you can see there's this dialogue that we're here to work with you and work together. But when we come to something like this, that's so important, so imperative that we preserve and do it right, we can't even get to the table and have a negotiation and come up with a plan. And, and so what they, they'll do anything to destroy it. They'll do anything to just, you know, stop Ocean Samp, stop CRMC and anything else. And that's awful. It's awful. It's not the way it should happen. That's not communication. That's a lack of communication. That's flexing your muscle, David and Goliath. So that's the reality. Anything I'm saying is absolutely true. So take it from there. All right. Thank you, Fred. Uh, Mary Ellen, do you want to, um, I know you have some other questions here that we want to talk about. Yeah. So I thought that Maeve's question about um, involving communities really inspired me to Think about diversity inclusion. And I know this is a conversation that we've been having um, outside of this webinar as well, but how do we bring in different groups to this conversation? How do we bring in um, underrepresented communities as well as um, especially women and people of color? If any of our panelists have any thoughts on that, I know that our panelists have done some work on this. So I'd love to hear about um, what you think is, um, what is being done, what needs to be done and what are the next steps in that? Well, um, you know, I can tell you that from an exodus standpoint, when we go out to hire, that's one of our that's that's one of our first places that we look towards as we look towards candidates. So we're trying to we're trying to work with those groups that represent um, people that are under represented in offshore wind to make sure that we're tapping into as many sources as possible to get as much of a diverse workforce as possible. And it is something that is ongoing. It is something we haven't solved. It is something that we are working on. And you know, I think that the, the thing, forums like this are very good because it gets our, you know, it gets the message out that we're looking for good, you know, intelligent, passionate people to work in the offshore wind industry. And we're taking it out to community job banks, community organizations in order to identify as wide a net of people that we can possibly find. 
but it is a challenge and it's something we're working on. So, no answers, we're just working on it. I'll, I'll weigh in a little bit here on our, our perspective. Again, we're primarily looking uh, for scientists and engineers. Um, and I, I kind of view this as inclusion, um, that, that really having agency and involvement in this industry for uh, communities um, across our region is absolutely critical. So it's not easy. Um, you do have to put out quite a bit of effort and uh, there are emerging, um, within science anyway, as many of you are probably aware, there's a lot of um, social media uh, groupings, uh, Black and Marine Science, a bunch of other organizations that are literally just virtual gatherings of people. And so by tapping into some of those resources, um, spreading, uh, I make a point that some of my former students teach at, at historically Black universities. I send out notices to them. I, I, you know, you just have to be extremely proactive. I mean, as you can gather the, the majority of people involved in the industry, the majority of people uh, showing interest in the industry are, are, there is a pretty decent, I think Chris can speak to the sort of women in, in wind, there's a pretty decent gender representation, uh, but as far as people of color and people of uh, disadvantaged communities, it's a, it's a much more challenging uh, prospect mm -hmm. to a certain extent uh, within marine science and within engineering, uh, that's broadly true, but it's changing very, very quickly. And I think the key here is that applied work is, uh, you know, a really powerful incentive because you're getting in on the ground level of a rapidly growing industry that is spreading around the world. So there's massive developments uh, in Asia. There's a beginning interest in South America. Um, and a lot of other locations. So this, this is a, a real interesting time and opportunity. And, and it is critical to get a wide variety of people in at the beginning because that experience and agency, I think really matters. Yeah, and thanks Drew for uh, you know, the comment about, uh, you know, there certainly is an increased representation for women in offshore wind and renewable energy in general. Um, there are some networking groups and kind of a theme I wanted to touch on more broadly is the importance of networking. Uh, most, most of the networking is now being done virtually, but there is an excellent group um, that is particularly focused on women in the space that's called Women in Renewable Industries and Sustainable Energy. And the acronym for that is RISE, W-R-I-S-E, riseenergy.org. Most states in the area have a chapter, a state chapter. I'm the co-chair of the New Jersey chapter, uh, but there really is great opportunity there for support um, when they have job boards, um, mentorship programs. Absolutely encourage men to be part of that network as well. Uh, shameless plug, we have a really interesting um, a, a virtual event for the New Jersey chapter on March 3rd where we're going to explore more issues around um, the, the transmission grid and operator space, certainly a hot topic or cold topic as you would have it in Texas right now. So um, look out for some of those networking groups and engage yourself with the trade groups like the Business Network for Offshore Wind and the American Clean Power Association because they're always looking for volunteers to work as part of their conference networks or others. And that'll really help you meet people who may inspire you and help you think about different opportunities in the space and different places to work, whether it's with a developer, an NGO, federal or state government in the supply chain. There are just so many you know, kind of different angles to look at, I think, uh, right now. And I think an interesting perspective just kind of outside of the job space regarding diversity and inclusion that Offshore Wind offers is in a related uh, tangent around environmental justice. Environmental justice in coastal communities, um, you know, I mean, it, it's kind of interesting because traditionally power plants tend to be built in, in areas where, you know, people don't have 
the, you know, the kind of the, um, the resources to fight back. And so you'll see a coal plant that's sited maybe in a poor neighborhood or, you know, these type of energy facilities. Very interesting to see kind of flipped on its head offshore wind farms being built off the coast of some of the most affluent neighborhoods in our nation. And so we're kind of flipping the whole energy environmental justice formula on its head. And I think it's interesting to kind of see how that plays out, especially as we look at the, the not in my backyard syndrome that we see so often popping up in the industry. I, I just was about to put it in the comments, but um, Sandra brought up a really good point about the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal. And I think I may have missed what the very beginning of what Chris said, but one of the many initiatives that just occurred a few weeks ago is the Executive Order 14008. I know that's a little geeky, but nonetheless, it's a, it's a really key piece of policy that is linking the response to climate change to environmental justice. So there are significant incentives in the executive branch. So this means, uh, pressure on agencies, uh, NOAA, uh, USGS, uh, BOEM, uh, US Fish and Wildlife, all the way up and down the uh, Department of Defense to incorporate, explicitly incorporate environmental justice and climate change uh, through coordination up through the executive branch. So there is both state and federal, not every state, but certainly some states are putting a lot of emphasis. So when you begin to have money, which is always crucial, flowing to uh, neighborhoods and communities that are really requiring and needing uh, vitalization and jobs uh, and policy following it, then this can have a pretty substantial effect. So it isn't just us reaching out and trying to find a couple of employees. You really need the massive amounts of money that are being invested and being made off of uh, a developing industry to flow back, as, as Fred pointed out, to the fishing communities, to the disadvantaged communities along the coast, to um, marine ports and locations that are either brownfields or abandoned because those ports are no longer uh, functioning as they were. These are tremendous opportunities because the manufacturing part of offshore wind is a pretty short piece. The, the support and maintenance is a long-term uh, prospect. Great, and I just wanted to highlight that there's a lot of great links being circulated in the chat. So if you're not in the chat, um, I, I urge you to, to get over into the chat and click onto those links because there's some really great resources being shared by all sorts of folks. I'm really happy and grateful for everybody sharing links in there. Um, I think that Jess has a great question that builds really well on this conversation. Sure. So my question is, in your opinion, what are the greatest challenges facing offshore wind in terms of workforce and incentivizing individuals to participate in this industry after graduation? And to follow up on that, what sectors of the industry have the greatest opportunity for young professionals? Uh, I'll start just by saying that a lot of, you know, when, when I was at Orsted, we would do job fairs, you know, at universities or otherwise many people are not even aware that offshore wind is a thing at all. Um, and I make it my business to educate at least one person every day who's never heard of offshore wind and explain to them what it is. That's kind of my life's mission. And so if I'm, you know, at the grocery store online, I'm like, oh, did you hear about that offshore wind farm off the coast of New Jersey? You know, like I, you know, I make it my life's work to talk to people about the industry because many students who are coming out are not even thinking about like this being a thing and something that really is so fascinating and multifaceted. I think, you know, we on this call are different because we're already interested and that's why we're here and we have a bit of a bias, but you know, writ large, many people have never even heard about this technology. It's exciting to me that it's that it's explicitly named in the president's climate executive order and that there is going to be real push and energy towards this issue going forward that we've never had before. And with the projects all in line and all those things lining up, it really is an inflection point. So it's exciting, but I think that part of the issue is just the day-to-day -day communication. It's not something that is, that there's a strong awareness about in, in our culture. Uh, 
You know, I would add also that, that to add on to what Chris is saying, it is an industry that includes so many different industries in it that there are opportunities for, you know, every everything from welders. I mean, it is just, I mean, it includes so many different pieces. And one thing that I know is happening within states that have a wind farm, have a PPA against them is they're really trying to gear up their training programs and actually build out into the community, if you will, wind certification programs at community colleges, et cetera. There's, and I see in the chat, there's like Win Win RI in North Kingston that's bringing wind education into uh, middle school and high school. And so that really is where it, where it starts. And so what Chris is saying is exactly right. There's also an education of current businesses to let them know that with a minor change or tweak, that they could be part of the industry itself. So it's it's on all of us to sort of talk about the various aspects of offshore wind and how companies and organizations at all levels can play a part in it because the industry doesn't exist right now. It's, you know, there there is this inflection point where the first couple, most of the technology comes over from Europe. In 2025 or 2026, by current sort of predictions, there'll be 300 turbines a year commissioned. That is not an industry you can keep bringing stuff over from Europe into. That has got to be localized. And so the opportunities locally within communities, not just states, but within, within communities that are typically clustered around industrial areas or ports, is really extensive. And so states are getting involved, regions are getting involved, economic development organizations are getting involved in order to supply a workforce to support this enormous growth. I mean, 300 turbines a year is sort of mind boggling. We have seven in the water right now. So, you know, think of the scale of that. And also it includes things like shipbuilding. It includes as Drew said, the, the operation and maintenance that lasts for 25 or 30 years beyond the construction phase. And so it's really the job of those of us in the wind industry, Drew, Chris, and myself, and all the others, to educate and to tell people there is this opportunity, and then to help them take it, to help them become involved in it. And I think I just wanted to, um, I, I noticed a headline this morning, um, there's a really great consulting firm who does a lot of policy work in the industry called RCG or Renewables Consulting Group. Mm -hmm. um, they released a study maybe yesterday or today that I, I'll try to find a, a link to and put in the chat, but describing the opportunities in the, you know, for the fishing community to diversify their work. And so, you know, if fishermen are experiencing a decrease in their opportunity for work, whether that's through quotas or you know other hardships, you know they have vessels. They know the ocean better than anyone. You know, as 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 Drew was pointing out earlier, how helpful it is to have local mariners out on the water. And so the opportunity for them to diversify their experience on the ocean, uh, I think, is a powerful one. And when I was at Orsted, we had a diversification program for many of the European fishermen so that their uh, their their vessels could be, uh, you know, meet the safety requirements of the industry, which tend to be very strong. And so, you know, the opportunity, I think, just for the, the maritime community, I know specifically in Rhode Island, shipbuilding and, um, you know, ship design and all the marine architecture firms, it's, you know, a, a very strong marine centered opportunity for a state, especially like Rhode Island. Great, and um, we have a few representatives of um, some programs that are actually working really, really well to make strides in workforce development for students um, specifically. Um, so I'd be remiss if I didn't give them a quick minute to talk about their programs and advertise those to all the folks and all the students here on, on the call. So I'm specifically looking at Kate Venturini, um, Gail from Sea Grant, and Will from Rhode Island Commerce. So I want to give each of you a minute if you would like to come on 
um, and unmute yourself to talk about your programs. So Kate, if we could start off with you, that would be great. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Jen and Mary Ellen and all my other friends here. I'm scrolling through the um, Brady Brunch grid looking at all of you. There are uh, some 2021 Energy Fellows in the room here, and I um, appreciate the opportunity to share with you all information about the URI Energy Fellows Program. I'm talking to the URI students and other students, but also to um, folks working in the industry. So the, the Energy Fellows Program was established in 2008, which seems like forever ago. We've trained around 150 students, undergrad and graduate level. And uh, around last count, 110 of them are actively working in the clean energy industry. We're very proud of that. Um, and the way it works in a word is that for one year, um, students are placed with a mentor. We're always looking for new mentors. Um, and they work minimum 600 hours. Students also get professional development and networking uh, training and opportunities, and then also participate in clean energy industry training in the summertime where um, when we're not in a respiratory pandemic, we take folks around, um, show them the control room at ISO New England, which is always incredible, um, and go up into wind turbines if we can, um, go to substations, et cetera. And so um, we've been around training students for 13 years. We have never had an offshore wind placement. We have placements with stakeholders like Fred Matera at the Commercial Fisheries Center, but we have never had um, an offshore wind company uh, work with us to provide an opportunity through the fellows program. And so I hope maybe you can tell I'm not shy. Um, I think the time is now, I think to get out ahead of this um, incredible boom that we hope to see, we'd really love to be part of the solution. Uh, the last thing I'll say is I agree with everything that's been said so far. And we've seen tremendous success with students who study everything from marketing to resource economics, to ocean engineering, um, find jobs in the industry. It, it really is gonna take a little bit of everything. Um, and I'm saying that as an outsider, but I've seen success. I've seen students who study um, ocean engineering take marketing jobs for a couple of years. Um, so I think um, thanks to all of you who are talking about interdisciplinary um, need in the industry. And if anyone would like to connect with me, my email address is Kate at uri.edu makes me sound a lot more important than I am. I'll put it in the chat. We'd love to talk with folks about being mentors for our students and also um, students. If you wanna learn more, get in touch. We can have a conversation. Thanks so much, Mary Ellen, Energy Fellows 2020. There it is. Thank you, Kate. Thanks. Yeah, as an Energy Fellow, I cannot recommend the program enough. Um, okay, so now we'll move on to Gail, 30 seconds to talk about your program. 30 seconds. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Gail Zidlewski. I'm the director of the Maine Sea Grant Program. So I'm hoping that many of you have heard of the Canals Fellowship Program. Um, and I'm putting it in the chat right now. Um, it's a, um, a fellowship program. As you come out of your graduate education, you would have an opportunity to work in D.C. with... Um, various different potential entities in the legislative or executive branch, but some of the interesting um, fellowships that are developing right now because of um, new ocean renewable energy um, activities include um, opportunities with Department of Energy and Sea Grant. So there's some interesting canal fellows happening this year that are joint uh, fellowships that get, might give you the opportunity to think about things from policy and stakeholder engagement, but at the very important level of being in DC and seeing it all happen um, right there on the ground. So I think it would give you a leg up in terms of, of your um, background and potentially working with industry moving forward as well. I hope that was not too much longer than 30 seconds. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Gail. And I also just put a link to an article that I got in my inbox this morning from URI of three students who have just been granted fellows. So definitely check that out. Um, all right, next we'll jump over to Will Cotta if he wants to unmute and 
talk for 30 seconds about his programs. Yeah, I, I guess I'll take 15 seconds and then um, I'll, I'll kick it over to Laura Hastings, who's also on this call for, for the last 15 seconds. And, and that's a, a lie about that time. But um, I'm at Rhode Island Commerce. I'm trying to fill Jeff's old shoes um, and, and relying heavily on the work he did beforehand and, and continuing to do. But just to kind of show you the difference in backgrounds and where people end up, my prior background is in the Coast Guard and, and Naval Architect by training and now in much more of a supply chain or business development role, which is kind of interesting. So you can definitely move around the industry. And I think a lot of the things said here today about communication is really important um, to, to kind of illustrate how you can move. Um, but yeah, we're, we're really working hard to develop the local companies in, in the state to be able to compete in this industry. And then where there's no company that can compete or where there's no company that fills a specific scope of work we're trying to recruit somebody from outside the area, whether that's Europe or um, you know different areas around the U.S. who can come in and, and help fill that, so we can really get an integrated supply chain within the state and hopefully make sure there's a lot of jobs for people. And uh, with that, I'll kick it over to Laura Hastings, who's actually doing the the good work of um, real jobs and you know the training part of it. Hi, I'm Laura Hastings. I am the deputy program director of Real Jobs RI, which is a workforce development program that's housed within the Rhode Island Department of Labor and Training. Quick aside, my background is generally uh, been in environmental policy. I worked for the state of Alaska for more than 10 years doing that. Um, I now do workforce development for Rhode Island, largely in the blue and green economy. So I've sort of meshed the two. Rhode Island is doing, um, right now we have two partnerships with respect to offshore wind. Um, one has already been mentioned, Wind Win RI is um, one of them, our partnership with the North Kingstown Chamber of Commerce. That is um, the high school certification program, amid, among other things. Um, and to quickly speak to the diversification of the workforce, our original high school that we had this program in was in North Kingstown and very purposefully, the second high school was Shea, which is in Pawtucket in a very urban school district. Um, we wanted to make sure that uh, people who wouldn't necessarily see the industry got a chance to see it. Um, my sort of mantra is you can't be what you don't see. So if you have no idea that this industry exists, to Chris's point, um, you, you, have to, you have to shout it. Uh, our job is to shout it to make sure that folks um, get exposed to it. Uh, our other partnership is with the Business Network for Offshore Wind. Uh, we do a multitude of different things with respect to workforce for them, including we had their uh, first presentation of their uh, foundation to blade training. Uh, we offered it to Rhode Island businesses to see that to hopefully see that they, that they could hopefully see uh, a way to get into the industry is not such a great leap. Um, so we're working from a workforce development perspective from sort of all angles from young students to uh, business owners in the hopes that um, we make it a, sort of an easy transition as this industry grows. Thank you. Thank you so much for all the folks who just shared all of their wonderful programs. If you um, haven't already, please drop your links over in the chat so we can, um, every, everyone can connect with you as well and check out more of your programs. I am going to right now put these four links in the chat. We have URI's Offshore Renewable Energy website, which is loaded with information. It has events, um, news blasts about URI's happenings and play in offshore wind. We also have an experts page. So if you are a current URI student and you are working in offshore wind, you should definitely be on the experts page. If you're not, definitely reach out to us. Um, we also highlight alumni. So same thing there. If you are a URI alum and are not on the experts page and feel you should be, reach out to us. And I'll drop my email here in the chat for you to reach out to. We also have a database called Ask the Experts, and that's also right on the Offshore Renewable Energy website. The Ask, the Ask the Experts database is a very extensive database full of synthesized research information. We have all um, topics covered from science to policy, and it's continuously being expanded upon. We will definitely be synthesizing some information from this webinar and putting that in there. Um, but if you were able to attend any of our webinars from 2020, we have a lot of information synthesized there as well. We also have the Rhode Island Blue Economy LinkedIn page, which is managed by my team at Coastal Resources Center in Rhode Island Sea Grant. So we would be so happy if you would connect with us there. And other than that, unless and um, any of our panelists have any last parting words or Jen would like to say anything. I would like to thank you all for coming. Thank you so much 
for, to our panelists for participating. Thank you to Venture Cafe for helping us with our technical aspect. And thank you to all for coming and submitting your questions.